Hi, welcome to Finding Stuff Out. I'm just getting over a sore throat, and gargling with salt water seems to help. It's like having my own little ocean. Speaking of that, here's a question from Vito. Are sea monsters real? <laughs> the Flat Earth Corner! Are sea monsters real? Well, landlubber, if you're a 16th century sea dog like me, you know they are. I haven't seen one myself, but my best friend's captain's daughter has, like the Kraken. A Kraken wraps its giant tentacles around a ship and eats every last sailor down to the bone. Then there's the Greenland Sea Serpent, its ferocious head taller than a ship's crow's nest, and the sea worm that can gobble up an entire vessel and its crew. Scary enough to have you running for the poop deck. Yes, the sea is full of monsters. Just ask my first mate's brother's neighbor's midshipman who knows somebody who knows somebody that got scuppered up by one. Ah! Hundreds of years ago, sailors saw strange things in the sea and thought that they were sea monsters. Today we know that the Kraken was probably just a giant squid, but pictures of a living giant squid were taken only a few years ago. The ocean is so big. We still don't know all the creatures that live down there. But I can confirm for you, Vito, that there is at least one sea monster. Today, I'm going to answer all your questions about the ocean. And by the end of the show, I'll show you that monster. Whenever I'm at the Sea Aquarium, there's always one question I want to find out. So, do you guys think that sea monsters are real? No. No. Yes. Uh, not really. So, uh, do you think sea monsters are real? No. <laughs> what about your bathtub? There's sea monsters in there, right? No. <laughs> if they do, did exist, what do you think they would look like? Well, it could be green or maybe gray from the water it's been in mm -hmm. and the pollution. A big blob, yeah. A big blob? A dark color, like green or black, and have sharp teeth. Sharp teeth. That's pretty scary. <laughs> so what do you think a sea monster would sound like? That's pretty good. <laughs> yep. <laughs> nice. Personally, I think the sea monster would look something like this. Scary. Time for another question. Why is the ocean salty? The short answer is... Because there's salt in it? I kid, I kid. But you're probably wondering how the salt got in there. And it turns out the ocean doesn't start out salty. Here's what I found out. Ah, beautiful clear spring water. Flows down from the lakes and the rivers down to the ocean. I like to think of it as clear juice. On its trip to the ocean, water moves over soil and rocks, which have salt in them. The water drags the salt into the ocean. Say this glass of water was the ocean, then it has this much salt in it. That might not sound like a lot, but if you take all the salt out of the ocean, it will cover the earth up to the height of a 40-story building. Wow! With all the salt in this water, you might be wondering, who drink this stuff? But that's exactly what Dakota wants to find out. Have a fish drink. To find out more about fish and how they drink, please welcome my special guest biologist, Dr. Adam Brown. Hey, Arson. Hi. How you doing? Good. So I hear you want to know how fish drink. Yeah, I asked my fish how he drank, but he just said... So I guess you don't really speak fish then? No, not really. <laughs> so how do fish drink? Is it out of a straw or a glass? Well, actually, fish don't really drink in the same way that we do. Okay. Mostly because they're bathing in water, right? So water either moves in or out of them on its own. And that's a process that we call osmosis. Okay. Which basically means that water tends to move towards areas that are saltier. And so, depending on where the fish will live in the world, it'll either always have to take on water mm -hmm. or always have to get rid of water. So can you show us how all this works? Well, yeah, exactly. I've got a great example for this mm -hmm. using a simple potato. The experiment! 
So what I've done is I've cut up some potato slices here that I'm mm -hmm. going to make be our sort of pretend fish. Okay. And I'm going to put these pretend fish into the two types of water that we have on Earth, salt water yes. and fresh water. Okay. Right? I think I have just the thing. Okay. That's not it. Oh, not that again. Oh, here it is. Okay. So oh. we can have potato fish. All right, let's make some potato fish here. It's a new species of fish called potato fish. Yeah. There we go. Potato fish number, number mm, one will one. be in the ocean. Okay. And potato fish number, number two. two. He gets to be in fresh water. That's right. Okay, so <laughs> let's put the salt water here on the ocean fish. Okay. Let's put the fresh water here in the lake or the river fish. Okay. So what's going to happen to these potato fish? Well, you remember I said that water moves in and out of organisms on its own yeah. based on osmosis, and yeah. it always goes to where it's saltier, mm -hmm. right? Well, here what we have is a potato fish in salty water. So okay. that potato fish is less salty than the water around it, meaning the water is going to move out of the potato yeah. fish into the salt water. Mm -hmm. And here what we have is the potato fish is in fresh water. It is actually saltier than the water around it. So the water is going to move in. The water is going to move in. That's what we expect to happen. So what you're saying is, if the salt water fish didn't drink, it would shrivel up. <laughs> There's the stuff. And fresh water fish absorb all the water that they need. So if they drank any more, they'd be a lot. <laughs> Well, yeah, that's exactly right. Either they pee a lot or they're going to end up exploding with all of that water in there. So how are the potatoes doing? Well, they're not quite ready. We still have to wait a little. Oh, I hate waiting. I have an idea. That's better. OK, well, we should be just about ready by now. Let's have a look and see what's happened. So we take our freshwater fish here and our saltwater fish here, and they're quite different from one another. I don't know if you can see it. This saltwater fish is definitely much smaller than the freshwater yeah. fish now, yeah. and it's squishier and kind of gross feeling. I don't know okay. if you want to touch that. Sure. I wouldn't, but now that you do, so oh, that, yeah. this one's softer. It's like mushy, and that one's not. This one's firm. So this has confirmed what we expected to happen, is that because this freshwater fish is saltier than the water, mm -hmm. the water has moved in, and it got bigger, and it got firm. Whereas here, the saltwater fish is less salty Mm -hmm. than the water around it. So the water's moved out and it's gotten all small and squishy and slimy. So you think with all the fish in the ocean, they would drink it all. Here's another question. How big is the ocean? Let's see. Most of the Earth is covered by water. Ocean rhymes with potion. Circumference of the Earth equals 40,000 kilometers. Carry the sphere. Remainder! <laughs> You're gonna make my head explode! I'm glad Adam is here to answer, because as far as I know, the ocean is ginormous big. Is that right, Adam? That's right, it is pretty ginormous. And I can see it's hard to get your head around sometimes, given what you just went through. But yeah. I've got a picture here I brought that might help illustrate this. Have a okay. look at this. And what we have here the is... The carpet. Well, it's hard to tell what it is, but do you see this pale blue dot right here? Oh, is that thing? That's the what? Earth. What? Yep. That's the Earth taken from six billion kilometers away. And from that distance, we call it the pale blue dot. Well, because it's a pale blue dot. But why do you think that is? Uh, because of the water. Oh, okay. Right. So even when you look at the Earth from a little bit closer, mm -hmm. like here, you start to recognize it a bit more. Yeah. And we call it the blue planet from this distance. But you can really see the oceans here. Mm -hmm. And you can even see that there's another form of water on the Earth. and you. You can clouds. see the clouds, right? Yeah. And they're made of water, too. So when you look at it on this level, mm -hmm. you can really see that there's more than twice as much water than there is land yeah. on Earth. Wow. So there's a lot. The ocean is so big that if we divided it up into swimming pools, then it would be enough water for everyone on Earth to have 75,000 pools each. Sweet, right? I'd tell you how many toilets it equals, but it's in the quadrillions. And you don't want to think about diving into that. Here's another question. Why does water make stuff float? So we know that rocks sink and feathers float, but what about huge ships? They float, and it's a good thing they do, because they transport things all around the world for us. 
So why do things float, Adam? Yeah, well, that's a really good question. And to help illustrate the answer, I'm going to use these two familiar objects. Relatively similar in size, even though one is a bit bigger than the other. Mm -hmm. We have our lemon and the citrus cousin, the lime. So what I'm going to do, put the lemon in the water, what happens? It floats. It floats. So we're going to put the smaller one in, so and what do you expect to happen? It should float or not. But it doesn't. <laughs> so what's happening here? Well, the answer lies in the word called density. These okay. objects are different densities, which essentially means that they have different amounts of air inside them. So in an object that has more air inside of it, it'll be float. less dense, and so it'll float. And so the opposite being that if it has less air inside, it's more dense, and then what happens? It sinks it like the sinks. line. Who knew? Well, I guess you did because you just showed me. But I think we should put all this to the test in... My Great Challenge! Today, my great challengers are Cameron... Yeah! ...and Benji. Woo! Okay, today your great challenge is to take a ball of plasticine like this and try to make it float. Another thing you have to do is once you have it floating is to get it from one end of the pool to the other without using your hand. But you have these fans to help you. Can we make the ball of plasticine in any shape we want? Well, yeah, actually. Whatever floats your boat. Okay, are you ready? Yeah! Get set, go! Benji's flattening his plasticine and Cameron's making his round. Can give it a shot? Ah, it looks like Cameron's plans were sunk. So that one didn't work. Are they getting the right idea here? Well, it looks like they're on the right track. Remember we were talking about the limes before and the lemons, and that was sort of a question of buoyancy and how much air is inside? Well, this is a bit of a different situation. It's more like the object and the water are pushing against each other. So what you want to do is you want to have like a push of war rather than a tug of war, and you want the water to win. So to push it up to the surface. And, oh. So great. Get in there, I think, though. I guess as well, you want the water to stay under the plaster scene and not to yeah. get on top of it, too. That would make a big difference. Cameron, trying again. Watch out for the Kraken. Benji, testing out his plasticine. Maybe you could think like a boat or a canoe, right? Because they have edges that come up so that the water doesn't come in as well. Of course, you can't have holes in your boat either. Yeah, well, that's right. <laughs> that's what I'm working on. So why do you think they're having such a hard time getting their plaster scene to float? Well, I think one of the reasons is because you chose a very difficult challenge today. But really, I think it's a question of making sure that the weight of the boat spreads itself out as much as possible over the surface of the water. And that's, yeah. that's really tricky to do. That's a nice flat pancake. Yeah. Place it really gently. No. Oops. This water got on top yeah, of it, right? that's right. OK, we're back to the canoe form over here. If you can try and make a lily pad here, Maybe that work. might be a good strategy. And you're going to have to put that in the water that really looks carefully, good. though. Looks like a pan, almost. Looks I like think he's getting really close there. Let's see. And it floats. Oh. oh, he has it. Look at it go. No. Cameron's boat floats because it weighs less than the water it pushes out of the way. No. Looks like yes. the lily pad was successful. Looks like Cameron's our winner. Yes. Congratulations. Woo. All right. Uh-oh. Do try this at home. OK, so here's an experiment you can do at home. All you have to have is two glasses of fresh tap water. Then, with one of the glasses of the fresh tap water, put some salt in it, and stir it up. And now, since salt water is more buoyant than fresh water, you take some eggs, you put the egg in the fresh water, it sinks, and in the salt water, it floats. Now it's time for another question. This one's from James. What's the deepest anyone has ever gone into an abyss? James, I looked up what an abyss actually is, and it turns out it's a really deep pit in the ocean. It's so deep, they gave it a really deep name. It's called Challenger Deep. If you took the tallest mountain on Earth, Mount Everest, and threw it into Challenger Deep, it would still be covered by like three Eiffel Towers of water. Oh. The deepest anyone has ever gone is when two guys went to the bottom of Challenger Deep. Did you ever dive down deep in a pool and your head started to feel squeezed? 
That's pressure from all the water above you. In the deep ocean, the pressure is so strong, we need to go down in submarines or our heads would implode. That means it gets smaller, like this. <laughs> Check out these weird creatures that live down there, but don't implode. These fish have to have some pretty cool adaptations to survive there. That means their bodies have changed to allow them to live down there. Because it's dark, some of them have bigger eyes or can even make their own light. They're totally freaky looking. But not as scary as this next question from David. Why do sharks die if they stop moving? Sharks? They're scary, especially with this music. So to find out the answer to your question, David, I'm gonna meet one. I'm so scared. But at least I didn't actually have to swim with one, like marine specialist Nicole Can does all the time at the aquarium. So Nicole, what are you gonna do today? I'm gonna go for a swim with these sharks. But they're sharks. Well, yeah, they're not as scary as everybody thinks they are. What is the scariest part of their body to well, you, Harrison? Well, they're sharks and they have big teeth and they'll eat you and they're gonna hurt you. <laughs> okay, let's talk about the teeth for a second. Granted, sharks have some pretty impressive chompers, yeah. but they used to be a lot bigger. Do you wanna see a tooth? Sure. Okay. This what? is actually a mold of the biggest shark's tooth we've ever found. It's about as big as your head. It is as big as my head, pretty much. <laughs> and this was called the mega tooth shark, but it's been extinct for a really long time. Nowadays, they have much smaller teeth. In fact, this is a real black tip reef shark tooth from the sharks I'm gonna go swimming with. So small. Yeah. And it's perfectly designed for eating fish, oh. not people. That's good. So let's answer David's question. Do sharks die if they stop moving? Some of them could. The black tip reef sharks in here, the big ones, mm -hmm. if they stop moving, they're not passing water over their gills, so they're not getting any oxygen. Basically, they stop breathing. But some sharks can actually do all of that and pass that water over their gills even while they're staying still, so they can hang out at the bottom and have a little bit of a rest. But they're still really scary. What if they come to my house and eat me? They're not gonna do that. Are you a sick or dying fish? Definitely not. Then they're not gonna eat you. These are top predators out in the ocean, but they have a really important job to do in their ecosystem. They eat the sick, the injured, or the dying prey items. And by doing that, they actually help clean those animals out so they don't spread their diseases to the rest of the population. In fact, they're keeping fish populations really healthy in the ocean. Well, then I'm not getting sick. I'm gonna go take some vitamins and eat some broccoli. All right, and I'm gonna go for a swim. Oh, well then, I'll save the broccoli for later. <laughs> Good luck, Nicole, but don't say I didn't warn you. So Nicole told me that sharks are at the top of the food chain in the ocean, but there's something at the bottom of the food chain that Nicole says is only about this big, but it's just as important, phytoplankton. And this phytoplankton stuff is a pretty big deal too. There are more than 5,000 species of it. Look at these. You know what's amazing? Phytoplankton produce half the oxygen for the whole world. Here's a question from Angelina. What do oceans do? You mean like on the weekend, or do you mean why is it there? I think the question is what doesn't it do? It's a highway for us to transport stuff around the world. It gives us food to eat and rainwater for us to drink and use to grow crops. We need the ocean to survive, and it's home to more species than we can even count. Let me catch my breath, and then I'll be able to answer the question that you've all been waiting for. Are sea monsters real? Whoa, Vito, the big answer is... I'm gonna show you one! There's no real proof that sea or lake monsters like the Loch Ness Monster exist. And the Kraken was probably just a giant squid. But just because those monsters aren't real, it doesn't make the ocean safe. But there is something really scary in the ocean, and I'm about to reveal what it is right now. There's a monster in the sea. Away! Yo, there's a monster in the sea. You better not go. It's spreading oil on the waves. For 20,000 leaves. And garbage in the deep. Davy Jones low. It's got billions of teeth. And billions of arms. It's eating all the fish. And, and it's, it's causing, causing lots of harm. But it doesn't look like these creepy beasts 
Cause the monster in the sea is you and me. Cause the monster in the sea is you and me. Yes, the monster in the sea is you and me. For a long time, humans have used the ocean as a bottomless supermarket and garbage dump. Not a good combination. Experts say that one out of every four species of fish is being caught faster than it can reproduce and make new fish. Fortunately, a lot of people, including kids, are realizing that we need to be careful with the ocean. We need to protect it if we want it and us to stay healthy and monster free. And if we want a place to surf. Thanks for helping me find stuff out. Gotta go hang Ken. Surf's up! Woo! Hi, welcome to Finding Stuff Out, where I answer your big questions. Like, what is all this stuff? Stick around and you'll find out. Because by the end of the show, I promise there will be an explosive finish. Now, I always start the show with one of your questions, so here's the first one. What will happen if someone cracked the earth? The short answer is... Mass destruction. Disaster. But seriously, if there are underground monsters waiting to escape, I want to know about them. So by the end of today's show, I'll find out what would happen if someone cracked the earth. Here's a question from Jaden. What I want to know is how does an earthquake happen? Well, there isn't an earthquake happening here at the moment, but I do know where to find out about them. My good friend and roving reporter Sydney is at the Science Center. The Sydney Report. Thanks, Harrison. Today I'm with Julie Jones, the earthquake expert. How does an earthquake happen? That's a great question. The earth is a bit like an orange. Inside the orange is liquidy and juicy. Inside the earth is liquid rock. It's hot. Now, on the outside of the earth, there's a crust, just like on the outside of the orange, we have a peel, but they're in plates. And so I've kind of shown here that we've taken the uh, orange open, and when those sh plates shift and move, that's when we get earthquakes. Julie told me that where tectonic plates meet, that's where earthquakes and volcanoes happen. Like here, around the edge of the Pacific Ocean. There are so many earthquakes and volcanoes there that it's called the Ring of Fire. This map shows the number of earthquakes that have happened in the last 30 days. Wow, there's a lot. Julie tells me they use something called the Richter scale to measure their energy. The actual scale ranges from zero to 10. Now we've never had a 10. That's incredibly a, a massive earthquake. But anything less than a two, we don't really notice at all. Uh, something from like a two to a three and a half or a four, you're going to notice the, the earth, you know, that's going to move a little bit. Maybe some of the, the china in your cabinet that's a little close together is going to rattle. You might see some liquid moving in a fishbowl, but it's still a fairly small earthquake. But once you get into the fours and the fives and the sixes, then the building starts to shake. And once a building starts to shake, there can be damage in a building. And once you get up to something that's a magnitude nine, well, those are some of the biggest earthquakes we've ever had. And those are incredible. The whole building just wobbles back and forth. They collapse, we have tsunamis. All of those things go with a nine. Right, so when the surface of the earth moves, the buildings move. And we try and make our buildings safe by building them using certain techniques. Here we have two distinct buildings. One is a very standard building, the other one is actually on a base that shifts back and forth so that when the earth shifts, in theory, it doesn't move around as much, making it a safer building to be in. You've got some handles, give the table a shake. Oh, I see. So this one moves with the earth, whereas this one just shakes back and forth. Yeah. Now, we just discovered that the, this building will uh, be the safer building to be in, so clearly it will survive a stronger earthquake than this one. I also read that diagonal crossways for a building would make it more stable. Does that mean that if I were building out of Lego or Connects, if I made my base of my house with diagonal crossed bars, that would make it stronger than just straight? Yes, if you're working in Connects, triangle shapes are the strongest shapes. So if you incorporate those with like a diagonal to an X across a square, that's going to be a stronger building. 
But what about something like a road? What would happen to a road? The plates go over top. So when it shifts, the road goes up, the surface goes up. Now, this is a big earthquake. So, Sydney, you had asked me about the Richter scale and how we measure um, earthquakes. This is a seismometer. Let's give it a demo. Why don't you give us a stomp, make the earth shake if you can, and we'll see how it measures up. Not too bad. It's a little. I made a blip. Made a blip. <laughs> so the, you can imagine that the more you've shifted the Earth, the greater the energy, the higher the magnitude. Oh no! What have I done? Whoa! Sorry about that, Harrison. Oh. Hang oh. on. Oh. 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 Just kidding. But imagine if tectonic plates had to explain to their mom who made this big mess. It's not my fault the earth went crack. He pushed me, so I pushed him back. It's not my fault this seismic rift. Pacific plate, he started it. When plate pushes plate, you get an earthquake. When plate pushes plate, you get an earthquake. Now here's a question from Rianne. How can they predict the weather, but they can't predict earthquakes? Actually, Rianne, even weather forecasts are only accurate seven times out of 10. There are so many forces involved in creating an earthquake that scientists still haven't figured out how to predict them yet. Uh-oh, do try this at home. If you're in an earthquake, you have to get away from anything that might fall on you. Even on a desert island. So what if the earth started shaking right now, like this? You feel that? The tremor, where do you go? What do you do? So the best place to be during an earthquake is outside, away from buildings, trees, and power lines. But, of course, you can't predict where you're gonna be when there's an earthquake. So during an earthquake, it's best to be under a sturdy table like this because it protects you from anything that falls. Another great place is to sit under a door frame because the frame protects you from things that fall. Whew. But you're not really likely to feel one unless you live near a fault line. This is a picture of the San Andreas Fault in California, where the Pacific Plate meets the North American Plate. The movement of the plates is slowly pulling California apart. Eventually, Los Angeles will slide past San Francisco in about 20 million years. So while we're waiting for that to happen, let's take a question from Atom, who wants to find out... How does lava get created inside volcanoes? <laughs> the Flat Earth Corner! So how does lava get created inside volcanoes? Well, here in ancient Rome, we've got that figured out. The god Vulcan has a blacksmith's forge in there. And Vulcan, Volcano, get it? <laughs> it's so funny because I made a joke and it was a funny one. <laughs> Silly Romans, I'm Rene Descartes. Here in the Renaissance, we admire the Romans, but instead of superstition, we have science. Through observation and deductive reasoning, I have concluded that volcanoes are created by the sun burning holes into the earth and allowing lava to escape. Makes sense, no? Descartes was a mathematical genius, but his explanation about volcanoes didn't make any more sense than the Romans. To find out how lava is created, please welcome a real volcanologist, Professor John Styx. Hi. How you doing, Harrison? Welcome to my show. Well, thanks for having me. So can you tell me how lava is created? This little can is going to tell us something about how volcanoes work. A can of mixed nuts? Yep. I think I know what's coming, but I'll bite. Are you saying that snakes make lava? Well, not exactly, wise guy. The experiment! 
How is a snake like lava? Okay, so that's a, a good experiment that shows that when pressure is released, mm -hmm. a volcanic eruption happens. What happens is the magma breaks, then you get lava. Magma is the melted rock and metal under the Earth's crust. It turns into lava once it reaches the surface of the Earth, like when it comes out of a volcano. So what do you have here? It's a can of soda. We'll pop this one open, slowly, and we'll fill up this baby bottle. Okay, soda pop is actually a great analog for a, a volcanic eruption and a volcano. Because what's happening is that you're releasing pressure, and when the pressure is released, bubbles come out. Oh, whoa. It's filling up. <laughs> so that's exactly what happened there. The bubbles the came out, air? and the pressure built up pressure. in the volcano. This is our volcano. So now it's time for another question. What would happen if volcanoes were everywhere? Yeah, what would happen? Would it be like my scene of destruction earlier? Yeah, it would be a mess, but it actually doesn't work like that. Mm -hmm. uh, there, are, there are most volcanoes are, are actually not erupting right now. They're fairly quiet. Oh, okay. And some volcanoes, after a few months or a few years, start, start to uh, get active, and they, and they go into an eruption, and they might erupt for a few months or years, but then they quiet down. There are a couple of volcanoes that are always erupting, but these are pretty small volcanoes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, then let's take another question. This one's from Melissa. Does lava turn into a special rock when it hardens? Okay, so think about uh, lava. We see pictures of lava flowing in places mm -hmm. like Hawaii, for example. Yeah. Okay, so it can come out as lava, but it can come out as ash, too, during an explosive eruption. So here is one volcanic rock. You can hold that. It's okay, so like it was like polished, sort of. Yeah, it's actually glass. It's called oh, okay. obsidian, and it has cooled really, really fast, just like glass does. That's really cool. Let's look at another one. Okay, so here's a piece of pumice. Yes, I've heard of this. Yeah, okay, so pumice is material that's been erupted out of the volcano, but the reason it's so light is that it's full of gas bubbles from all the gas, just like our can, okay? Same, same, same idea, full of gas bubbles that came out of the magma as it was erupted. Do you think this is heavy? Probably. It's not actually that heavy. No, you're just going to show okay, it. Yeah. Okay. So inside this rock, this is a great rock. Yeah. So this is called a volcanic bomb. And inside the rock, it's full of bubbles, OK? It and on the outside, like this, like it in. cooled faster than inside. Really? So it's full of cracks. Thank See you. all these are the cracks? Oh, yeah, all these things. Yeah. And then oh. inside here, if we dropped it, which I'm not going to do, <laughs> if we dropped it, we it would, would see tons of bubbles. It would look something like that right. inside? Yep. It, it would split open, yeah. yeah. Okay. Let's, let's do one more thing. Okay. So let's think about magma flowing in a conduit before it gets, before it erupts, okay? okay. Flowing through the throat of the volcano. Mm -hmm. So here's the magma right here. It's actually sort of silly putty. Okay. So we're gonna, what we're gonna do is we're gonna make the magma flow slowly first. Okay, so, okay, so just, just pull slowly. Okay. Okay, here's, so here's slowly flowing magma. Okay, no problem. Lava comes out and so forth. Okay, perfect. Okay. So now, all of a sudden, for some reason, maybe because there's a lot of gas in the system, mm -hmm. the stuff, instead of flowing slowly, it's flowing fast. One, two, three. Okay? Oh, it so it didn't flow. It, it, it didn't flow. It mm -hmm. actually broke. So it can come out as big pieces. One big piece, one big piece, one very big piece. But it can also ones. come out as ash. So these oh. are very small pieces. So that's how you get all these cool shapes I found. Okay, so this is uh, a picture of the Giant's Causeway mm -hmm. in Northern Ireland and it's showing a series of lava flows, and the columns, you, they're actually called columnar joints, okay. and it's caused by the cooling of the lava. This other picture is a picture of the Hawaiian Islands. I think it's a very great place to look for lava flows. You can see wonderful lava flows actually in the process of forming and flowing and actually flowing into the ocean sometimes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this is an example of a lava tube. Oh, and a lava tube is basically just as it sounds, lava flowing through a tube. Mm -hmm. And one reason it's able to flow in the tube is because the tube insulates the, the lava. So it stays hot, it's able to flow, and it's actually able to flow sometimes very long, long distances. Okay, so now what are we doing over here? Okay, we're going to look at two pieces of volcanic rock. Okay, Pick so... Pick up the first one. This one. So and... people actually use that for their barbecues. Uh, it has a bunch of holes. Yeah, okay. throw it in the water now. Okay. 
Okay, so that sinks. It sank right Most away. volcanic rocks sink. Yeah. Throw that one in the water. Okay, so this one, it floats. It's got so many bubbles, it's super light, less dense than water, so it actually floats. And this is from a highly explosive volcanic eruption. So maybe it's the only rock that floats? Yeah, I think it, I think it is the only rock that floats. That's exactly wow. right. So thanks for helping me find stuff out. Can you come back later for the big finale? I wouldn't miss it. Awesome. Amazing, isn't it? Volcanoes make you think of destruction and ruin, but there are a lot of positive things that come out of them too, like soap. Besides that, volcano stuff is also made into blades that eye doctors use to perform delicate surgery. It's in the cement used to build our homes and schools, and in fertilizers that help to grow our food. Let's take another question. This one's from Sam. My question is, what's the temperature inside of a volcano? The temperature inside of a volcano? Okay, let's take a look. The temperature inside of my house is about 20 degrees. And we know a volcano is hotter than that. Water boils at 100 degrees Celsius, but rock melts much hotter than that. Our oven can bake up at 220 degrees. But I don't think rock can melt in it. Maybe if we use 16 ovens, 220 times 16, probably close to the temperature of my brain right now, which is hot enough to... <laughs> You're gonna make my head explode. So I'm gonna go out on a limb here and say that the inside of a volcano is really hot. But to get a more precise answer, I'm gonna go over to Sydney at the Science Center. Over to you, Sydney. Thank you, Harrison. Now we're gonna meet George Karunas. Speaking of which, where is he? What is that? <laughs> Hi, Sydney. How are you? I'm pretty good, getting kind of warm in here. <laughs> what is this? This is my volcano heat suit. It's a specially designed wow. suit that allows me to not only get close to volcanoes, but right up to the lava. So you've been into real volcanoes with this? Several times, yeah, it's what I that do. That is so cool. I explore erupting volcanoes. It must have been really hot though. Exactly, and that's why I wear the suit. Lava can be 2,000 degrees. Now imagine if you're baking a cake at home, that's only 350 degrees. So if lava were to cover your car, it would melt. It's, it's hot enough to melt rock. I've been in a situation where I've had lava in my hand, like a hot potato, it's Ooh. so hot. So you must have been in there very short periods of time, otherwise this you might even burn. Exactly, it will protect me, but not for a long time. I'll put on the suit, I'll get into the volcano, close to the lava, maybe for a few minutes to grab a sample, take some photos, and then out. So how does a volcano work? Well, I've got a simulation right here and I can show you. Hit the button. Okay. So the volcano is <gasps> one of the biggest kinds. Yes, and when they have a huge eruption, look at that. rocks can go flying for kilometers out of the volcano. <gasps> and look at the streaks of ash with the rocks. Yep. Tremendous flying amounts up. of ash that can bury cities oh and spread more than halfway around the world. It's almost like an avalanche of ash. That's exactly what it is. That's a pyroclastic flow. It is an avalanche of ash and hot gas pouring down the side of the mountain. Pompeii is a city in Italy that was completely buried by ash in 79 AD, a long time ago, and they were actually able to excavate, find the city underneath, and they actually found the shell of people that were buried by the volcano 2,000 years ago. The shell? By digging down, they were able to find empty spaces in the piles of ash where people used to be. Oh. They filled those holes with plaster, and when they took away all the ash, they found the shape of human beings. Whoa. It's really amazing to see. The power of a, vol of a volcano, it's like a gigantic bomb going off. If the city was at the bottom of the volcano, mm -hmm. could any people run away and escape before it came in? Depends on the size of, a, of the volcanic eruption. A big eruption, like the one that we just simulated here, you would have pretty much no chance of running. How does that suit protect you then? Well, let me show you. Come on. All right, I'm gonna show you exactly how this suit protects me from a volcano's heat. I got my friend Mark here. He's gonna breathe fire on me. Stand back. Cool. I'm not sure what they're about to do, but whatever it is, do not try it at home. Whoa. Ready? Thank you 
guys so much for joining us. Back to you, host Harrison. What a coincidence! That's how my grandma bakes her cookies. Thanks, Sydney. And now it's time to go to the question that started this investigation. What will happen if someone cracks the earth? The big answer is... Nothing new. The earth already is cracked, and it's still cracking and shifting as we speak. Along with that, we get new mountains, new islands, and we have to live with occasional earthquakes and volcanoes. Which unfortunately, we can't predict. But here's something we can predict. At the beginning of the show, I promised you a huge eruption. And here it is. So here I am, back at my school's loading dock, which they have let me use for this demonstration. And Professor Styx has come to help me out. Yeah, Harrison, we're gonna make a, an explosive eruption. We're gonna shake up these cans and we're gonna simulate a volcanic eruption on okay. three. Ready? Okay. One, One, two, two three. three. <laughs> <laughs> All right, not bad. So that was fun, but it wasn't that explosive finish that you've been waiting for. Right, Professor? Yeah, I think we can do better. Yeah. Wait, what's the first thing you do when a volcano erupts? Uh, run? As fast as you can. Okay. Ready? One, two, three. See you next time for more Finding Stuff Out! Hi, welcome to Finding Stuff Out. The show is simple. You ask, I find out. It's not rocket science, unless you ask a question about rockets. Then it is. Here's today's first question. It's from Joy. How come weather just changes to other weather, like first it's hot, then it's cold? Yeah, what gives? Weather's always changing and I don't know why, but by the end of the show, I'll have the answer to your question. Along the way though, there'll be tornadoes, snow, hail, and if my dad doesn't fix the washing machine soon, maybe even a flood. I'm going to start the investigation with a question from Hanifa. How could the sun be out in winter when it's cold? Yeah, come on, son. Either you're hot or you're not. Pick a side. Pretend this light bulb is the sun. Now, lucky for you guys, I did some research on the subject. Now pretend this is the Earth, us. The Earth orbits around the sun. The sun feels hotter in the summer because the part of the Earth you live on is tilted toward the sun. Six months later, when the Earth has moved around to the other part of the sun, the part you live on is tilted away from the sun. So we can still see it, but we're not getting the full effects of the sun's rays. So it's not as hot. Next question. How many kinds of snowflakes are there? How many different ones? Let's see. They say no two snowflakes are alike. And they're only this big. I wonder how many fit in a teaspoon. It must be hundreds. But when it snows, there's so many of these, you need a shovel to clear a path. That must be millions. And then you need a snow plow to clear your street. There must be billions, or trillions, or bajillions, or gazillions, or whatever they call a number that high, and <laughs> You're gonna make my head explode. I don't know if bajillion's a number, but there must be a bajillion different snowflakes out there. But seriously, Nobody knows how many different snowflakes there are, but I can show you some of them up close with my Super Zoomomatic. Check out these snowflakes. They all sort of have six sides. Weird. I'm not sure if they're different or the same though. So let's see. Different, different, same. Oh wait, no, different. Ah, forget it. I'd rather look at a bajillion snowflakes all at once than each flake one at a time. Cause that would mean snow day! Though I'm with Elizabeth on the next question. Why can't it just be sunny all the time? That would be amazing, Elizabeth. To figure it out, please welcome my special guest, TV weatherman, Frank Cavallaro. Hey Harrison, how's it going? Hi Frank, welcome to my show. Nice to be here. Now, did you bring your thunder for the interview today? No, but I got something else for you. Oh. Some snow. Okay, so could we have sun all the time? 
I don't think so because there's always going to be some cloud cover around, so therefore it'll block the sun's rays. Uh, so no permanent sun? Actually, that's a good question. You know, there's going to be a time every year, I'm going to use the globe here, there's going to be a time every year for six months where the North Pole, as the Earth rotates, will have daylight for six months. Well, I'm just going to move there. No, but hold on now. It doesn't mean it's going to be hot. But look at what happens six months later. The South Pole will get the sun, and the North Pole is dark for six months as the Earth rotates. Living in darkness? I'll leave that to the mushrooms. Anyway, here's a question from Shakur. My question is, why is there wind? The short answer is... Three bean chili! <laughs> but seriously, I found out that the sun causes wind. The sun heats up the land and the air, which causes hot air to rise. Then, cold air zooms in to take its place. Hey, I should make a song about this. It could be a rap. Hit it! Yo, yo, hot air goes up, cold air goes down. That's when we feel wind on the ground. It blows around leaves and sticks and twigs. It even blows off my grandpa's wig. Land heats fast and water slow. That changes how the wind will blow. Yeah, wind will go just where it needs because air heats up at different speeds. <laughs> All this talk about wind takes my breath away. Hey, that reminds me, I can make my own wind. <gasps> See, wind. You can measure the direction and the speed of the wind using something called a wind sock. Frank will show us. Uh oh, do try this at home. Here, I brought this sock for you, Frank. We're not here to measure smell. We're here to measure wind. Well, I think you can also do it with a paper bag, so you can try this at home. Here, show us. Okay, let's try this. I'm going to use a fan in this paper bag. This is a light breeze. Anything over 10, 11 kilometers an hour is a light breeze. But watch what happens if we get a gust of strong winds. Whoa, it opened right up. And this could cause damage to branches, trees, roofs, and your hair. Uh, not my hair. Yeah, yeah your hair. Uh. So Harrison, you may have noticed that airports and helipads, they have these wind socks there. You okay. know what they do? Yeah, are they those orange things, right? I don't know what they are, though, what they Mo do, I mean. Well, most planes will land and take off against the wind. OK. So that means? That means that they look at the wind sock and that tells them which runway to use as they're approaching the airport. So a wind sock is the airport's version of our paper bag. That's right. So I guess if a plane is landing, they'd be facing that way, right? That's right. They'd come down. OK, so what can kids use this bag for outside? Well, you can actually go in your backyard and take out a bag on a windy day mm -hmm. and put up the bag and it'll tell you how strong the winds are. And which direction, And right? which direction. And if there's no wind, then look what happens to the bag. It just dies. Well, Frank, I just thought of another thing you can do with the paper wind sock. What's that? Well, if you blow it up with air. And then you can make thunder. Here's another question. It's from Ben. Where do clouds come from? I looked it up, Ben, and I made this animation to show you where clouds come from. So these water vapors in the air grab onto a piece of dust. And when a billion of their buddies do the same thing, we start to see them together as a cloud. The air up there is colder, so the cold air causes the water to condense. Then these drops crowd together like it's a huge party and start bumping into each other. As the droplets bump together, they form bigger and bigger droplets, and then when they're too heavy to float in the sky, they fall as rain. Here's a question from Chloe. How do other people know if it's going to be sunny or not? <laughs> 
the Flat Earth Corner! How does a weatherman in ancient Babylon know if it's going to be sunny or not tomorrow? Astrology, of course! If I look up in the heavens, I can see that the moon is in Virgo, in the fourth house. Jupiter is rising. That means I predict you're going to get good news, win friends, and influence poultry. Also, it's going to be sunny and mild. Mars is activating my second solar house! This can't be happening! Maybe I should have dissected a chicken instead. In ancient times, people used to use the stars and the planets to try to predict the weather. But it didn't always work out. So, now we have high-tech equipment that helps us predict the weather accurately. Well, most of the time. Right, Frank? Yeah. I guess that's a sensitive topic for you. I mean, how do you predict the weather? Do you flip a coin? <laughs> no. We use radar, satellite, uh, we have different data, computer models that show us the jet stream, the wind, systems that are developing. We put everything together and that's how your forecast comes out. How come with all this high-tech equipment, you still get the weather wrong sometimes? Well, Harrison, you know, Mother Nature is always full of surprises. The weather can change drastically, very quickly. How can the weather change so fast? Things happen. The winds change direction, brings in colder air, temperatures drop, then the warmer air comes in, temperature goes up. It happens. Wouldn't you be able to see the wind changing directions and stuff with all your fancy high-tech equipment? And most of the time we do, but there are exceptions to the case where sometimes the weather just changes drastically that the computer did not pick up. But we're getting a lot better. We now have long-range forecasts. We can tell you the weather six, seven, eight days down the road, but I gotta tell you, it's tough to do the weather sometimes, but it's fun presenting it. Well, let's see how hard Frank's job really is with... My Grace Challenge! Today, my contestants are Justin and Samantha. So today, you're gonna to be using your knowledge of wind, clouds, and forecasting to become TV weather forecasters. Think you can do it? Yeah. Okay then, Frank, please tell us how you do your job on TV. Okay, guys, follow me. So this is where it all happens, guys. It's this all is... green in here. Frank says he stands in front of a green wall when he presents the weather on TV. That's because there's a technical process that takes all the green out of the picture so he can put any kind of background behind us. Like this, this, this. Or, if you're a TV weather person, a map. This is a clicker, by the way. Every time I press on this, a different map goes on. It could be a radar, a satellite, whatever I want to show. This advances my map, so it's all computerized. So let's show the kids at home. Uh, so they see a map behind us right now, right? That's right. They see a map, and when I click, the map will change. And you point. OK, let's do the challenge. Here's a map of the world. I'm going to be telling you different weather conditions, and your mission is to try and predict the weather and where it will occur. Now there are five different weather icons. Sun, snow, rain, cloud, and wind. And I'll be asking you where to place the specific icon to a corresponding city. But here's the catch. The viewers at home will see the map. You won't see the map. You're gonna have to use that monitor. It's just like how Frank does his weather forecast. Your goal is to make as few mistakes as possible. Okay, Samantha, you're up first. Justin, you can go downstairs and have some milk and cookies with my mom. Yes, I got the fresh ones. Leave some for us, though. Maybe. Okay, are you ready? Yeah. Okay, first question. Water droplets have formed giant heavy clouds over London. What's going to happen? Oh, Samantha's going for the rain icon. Not wasting any time. Yeah, that's it. Good, Good job. job. Okay. Next question. The hot air over Thunder Bay is rising and cold air is moving in. Go. Samantha's grabbed the wind icon. Oh, she's close. Not quite. Yes, she's got it. Okay. Treble cone is in the southern hemisphere and it's July. Well, Samantha's found the southern hemisphere but can't seem to locate treble cone. <laughs> and is that the right icon? No, eh, not, that's not it. That's not right. That one's a little hard. What happens in the northern hemisphere in July? It becomes hot. What happens in the southern hemisphere in July? It becomes cold. Oh. There you go. That's correct. It's snowing. Okay. 
Water vapor is condensing over Beijing. Go ahead. Samantha's going for the rain icon again. No. Nah. no. I'll read the question again. Water vapor is condensing over Beijing. What's happening? Clouds. There you go. There you go. Perfect. And that's it. Okay, Samantha, you're done. We'll send you downstairs for some milk and cookies, and now we'll bring Justin up and see how he does. Okay, Justin, now you're up. The first question is, water droplets have formed giant heavy clouds over London. What's going to happen? Justin wastes no time in grabbing the rain icon. That's right. Next question. The hot air over Thunder Bay is rising and cold air is moving in. Go. Justin's checking out the monitor to see where Thunder Bay is. No. Yep, there you go. That's it. Okay, treble cone is in the southern hemisphere, and it's July. Justin also going straight for the sun. No. Nope. Uh, wrong icon. Nope. Listen to the question carefully. Treble cone is in the southern hemisphere. It's July. Justin's going for the rain icon. Uh. Oh, but he changes his mind. There you go. That's it. Final question. Water vapor is condensing over Beijing. What's it going to be? Justin's got the cloud icon, but where's Beijing? And Justin's found it! All right. And now we'll get Samantha and announce the winner. Samantha, you can come up now. OK. And the winner is Justin! Yes. Good yeah. job. Congratulations. Good job, guys. Thank you. Thank you. And now we have a question from Max. Why are tornadoes dangerous if they're just air? Yeah, how is air dangerous? I mean, I can just push it with my hands. Well, Harrison, air could be dangerous. When the pressure starts going up and down drastically in a short period of time, it can cause some serious damage. I want to do a little demonstration on a tornado. Okay. And of course, tornadoes can cause some serious damage, as we all know. Look at that. The wind speed of tornadoes sometimes could hit over 400 kilometers an hour, over 250 miles an hour. Whoa. And the thing with tornadoes, they don't give you a lot of time to get away. They just pop up because the wow. pressure goes down, the pressure goes up, and this is what happens. And that's why tornadoes are very, very dangerous. That's crazy. Now to find out how dangerous tornadoes really are, let's talk to George Coronas, who's a real live storm chaser. He's out chasing storms as we speak. Hello, George, I see you're out in some terrible weather. You could catch a cold out there, you know? Harrison, as a storm chaser, catching a cold is the least of my worries. <laughs> so first of all, I think the kids at home probably want to know, what is a storm chaser? Well, what I do is I try to get up close to the most dangerous part of the storm and then send in my reports so that people downstream of the storm can get those reports and hopefully save a few lives. That sounds pretty risky. Why are tornadoes so dangerous? Well, it certainly can be dangerous. It's not so much that the wind is blowing, it's what the wind is blowing. Pieces of debris, which could be branches, bricks, cars, sometimes even houses. Wow. <laughs> so have you ever been inside of a tornado? I have actually been inside a tornado once before with debris flying around. It's a very, very scary experience, one that I don't want to do again. How'd you end up being right inside of a tornado and stuff? Well, sometimes a tornado will change its path. I'll be tracking the storm and it will change direction. And sometimes I have to get out of the way. There's, it's a force of nature. It can be very unpredictable at times. So what technology do you use to help you chase? Well, I've got all kinds of technology here in my storm chase vehicle. I've got my laptop computer that has satellite and radar imagery. I've got all my radios that I can use to send my reports in to the National Weather Service. GPS, all kinds of gadgets. It's basically a mobile command center on wheels. So I'm pretty sure everybody watching wants to know, where do you go to the bathroom when you're chasing <laughs> storms? When you're on a storm, Harrison, anywhere you can. Anywhere you can. That's a little awkward. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes it is. There's not a lot of trees out in Kansas, so you just have to find a place, and it's not always easy. Do you get any adrenaline going when you're chasing the storms? Absolutely, it's a bit of an adrenaline rush, especially when you're up close to a tornado and the wind speed can be several hundreds of kilometers per hour. I'd be lying if I didn't say that I got some kind of adrenaline rush out of it. Do you have to ever like drive away or like run away from storms or tornadoes? 
there's been numerous times where I've had to get out of the path of a tornado to turn tail and flee. I try to do a dangerous thing in as safe a manner as possible. Yeah. Oh, looking at the radar right now, it looks like I might have a developing tornado on the horizon. Are you gonna go out and chase that right now? Uh, yeah, it looks like I'm gonna have to blast west here. I have a developing tornado. Wow. Hold on, let me get the radio here. Yeah, this is George K relaying a message. It looks like we might have a tornado forming just to my west. I'm gonna try and intercept and get closer. Harrison, I gotta go. Well, thanks for being on the show, George. It was great to have you, and I guess you have to go chase this storm. Okay, I'm headed straight for the tornado. Stay in touch. Okay, be safe. Bye. Whew, George sure does love his scary weather. Speaking of scary weather, here's a question from Samantha. Why does hail hurt so much? Ah, hail. The snowball's angry cousin. Usually a raindrop grows until it's too heavy, and then it will fall to the ground. Matter of fact, let's check back in with my buddy, the raindrop. Hail is created when the raindrops, instead of falling down, get blown further up to colder air. The raindrops freeze into ice, get bounced around by the wind, and get bigger and bigger until they get too heavy and fall. This means that instead of having a gentle drop of rain, you have a painful ball of ice! Ah! It's like waking up in the middle of a snowball fight. Watch these clips that George sent us! On George's last storm chase in Nebraska, he found hailstones as big as baseballs. Man, weather is no joke. I've found out a lot about weather, so I think it's time to answer Joy's question that started today's episode. How come weather just changes to other weather, like first it's hot, then it's cold? The big answer is... There's lots of reasons. The tilting of the earth changes the seasons. Wind blows when the sun heats up the air. Water vapor forms clouds, and clouds block the sun. But there's no clouds here today, so I'm gonna go outside and enjoy the beautiful day. See you next time for more Finding Stuff Out. <laughs>